this is a story that I've been wanting to tell for a long time and didn't really know how to tell it. On my bookshelf, I have a stack of books and booklets that are labeled with writings of C.W. Smith. And the principal question today is, who is C.W. Smith and what did he write? There's always a backstory in these kinds of things, and I'll try not to make this backstory too long and boring for you. But spring of 1981, I, uh, I got out of the Navy, came back to Albuquerque, my hometown, and because I'd been trained in video technology and didn't have any plans immediately to go to college or anything, I just decided to go get a job as a TV repairman. I worked at a place called Ed's TV Sight and Sound Lab, and I met there an older gentleman, so I was in my middle 20s, and he must have been almost 60 years old by the time I first knew him. An old gentleman named Ward. He was the father-in-law of the owner. And Ward was a World War II veteran and a Canadian citizen who was born in Nova Scotia, Spring Hill, uh, the same town as Anne Murray, the singer. Uh, he was a World War II veteran, spent time in Goose Bay, Labrador as a radio operator, and then after the war he worked for the Canadian DOT, and then he found himself in, in, the, in the United States and down in the desert of New Mexico. He spent another career as a TV repairman, and I first started to know him pretty well after a few years working at the shop. And I discovered that he was in the process of writing his own poems, his own stories, his own memoirs in a sense, uh, using portable manual typewriters. It wasn't until uh, we became close enough friends that I visited him in his home on the weekends that I saw how he did his writing. And uh, he was a typer. He was using manual typewriters long, long before there was ever a typewriter revival. I'll start off with this piece, uh, probably dearest to his heart. Uh, this is called The High Place. And so Warden was... Uh, born and raised in Nova Scotia, Canada, and he always had a fond memory, a fond recollection of his growing up years in that environment so different from New Mexico and Albuquerque. The, these were just done on uh, copy paper. He didn't even staple. I think it's, it's glue bound. So it's folded in half, but it's glue bound. He always talked about the mountain. He wanted to return to the mountain. The mountain is not merely something eternally sublime. It has great historical and spiritual meaning for us. From it came the law. From it came the gospel on the Sermon on the Mount. We may truly say that the highest religion is the religion of the mountain. And so that was his starting point. And then the next page a Cobbacud mountain girl where that coal axe rung and snowbirds sung, a song heard round the world. So these are poems of his recollections of living on the mountain, having grown up on the mountain. His first piece starts out called The Mountain. There's a place known as The Mountain, still very dear to me, where I was born on a warm June morn and she reared me tenderly. So this is the recollections of of growing up in this rural environment so different from where he later on ended up in Albuquerque. He ends this little book with this little paragraph here that says, when I get to heaven they'll probably tie me down Friday nights else I'd be off to the mountain for the weekend. And then he finally finishes as a addendum. He says, Mark Twain once quoted an old hero as having said, Nothing adds so much weight and dignity as an appendix. May I say, I lost mine at age 11. Who is to say what will deprive a man of his weight and dignity? It, it, later in life, when, when he had moved back to uh, Canada or he was living in Arizona, he would call me and we would talk on the phone and he would say, do you have this book, Joe? If not, I'll, I'll send it to you. And he would send me sometimes a duplicate copy, but it's pretty cool. So the, the High Place was really about him growing up in Canada. And then he, he published several different versions, but it's called North to Mecatina. 
So there's two different copies I have of North Demecatina. You know, each one of these is a one-off creation of his. But the one that I really cherish a lot is this little red and black hardcover bound edition. And I wanted to show you this. This is a kind of a Xerox machine copy of an old photograph of the snowy landscape where Ward served. He writes in the preface here, and I, I will show you this because it's important to get a sense of the of the quality of the of the typing the, the grade of paper the quality of paper on this uh, is not absolutely great uh, it's yellowed a little bit over the years but i love the obvious manual typing on here so north demecatina this sketch is designed to preserve a little of the life and times of a small crew on an isolated radio weather station in the North Country. And then he says, many thanks go to the Canadian Department of Transport, my memory of Mecatina, which may have failed me at times, and to the crew who did not. And he names the, his crew that worked with him. The book is essentially a series of stories of him retelling a number of stories of having lived up there before and after the war. But I gotta show you these, this picture here. That's Warden in Mecatina. Yeah, there's a number of uh, kind of Xerox quality copies of black and white photos. But one of the pieces that's really fun to read is a thing called Mecatina Logic. He starts off by saying, uh, having found myself banished to the bush for a tour of isolation, I discovered that a period of approximately six weeks is generally sufficient to cause one to melt down begin to fit into the swing of things, to begin to understand the crew, to quit contesting statements at one time you knew to be without question, somewhat smudgy fact-wise. Observations and conclusions bordering on the irrational became lucid and logical. Well-forged facts and wise old saws bent without criticism. It may be said, we were cognizant of the deviation, but the crew, to a man, flowed with it, and we remained a mellow group throughout a year's seclusion. Mecatina logic, we called it. It carried us over the rough spots. And he goes on to describe how a person's mind, mindset changed in isolation in the North Country. But these were wonderful stories, and I've read them enough over the years to think that somehow, in some strange way, they have become my stories as well, because having known Ward for so long. The next little piece I want to show you guys is this little kind of a zine style booklet called 1112 Dig and Delve. Ward started using a pen name or pseudonym of Baron Sands. Baron Sands was his pseudonym, but I guess indicative of the fact that he was uh, living in New Mexico now and not Nova Scotia, but he gave this to me in 1989. Such a great quality of typing here. I mean, it's classic manual typewriter uh, typeface. But uh, this is a little humorous piece that's sort of loosely based on Mark Twain's The Innocents Abroad. And uh, he says, suggested reading The Innocents Abroad, Mark Twain. Read the following at your disposal, then drop it in. <laughs> your disposal, obviously. He was so funny. He goes to the Coliseum with Mark Twain's character. And, and then he has a little suggested list of further books you might want to be interested in reading, which are all fictitious books, of course. But, you know, so this is the work of a creative person who uh, enjoyed the, the work of writing. And also penned under the same pseudonym of Baron Sands, he wrote a book called Lifesavers. He would go through phases where he would rewrite the books and take things out and put things back in. But... This is the big version of Lifesavers, and then later on he gave me a little kind of a zine style that I think had less work in it. But I have both of them. This one was uh, hand-bound by him, and the glue binding is, it was just glued, it was never stitched, and so the glue binding is coming apart in some places. He writes in the introduction, he says, When I was a child, I knew reality. I grew up with reality. Sometimes on Saturdays, to ease the burden of reality, we went to the movies to see make-believe. Make-believe intrigue, make-believe love, make-believe hate, disaster, sea voyage, train trips, situation comedy, western, all make-believe. The Western seemed the most harmless, the least reality, best make-believe. I myself, perhaps a dreamer, am found shipped off to a land of make-believe, a land of enchantment, where 
When nothing is on the horizon, the mirage comes into play. Whimsy, constituent to the lands of enchantment, offer divergence where the dreamer may escape for a moment, for a lifetime, fulfilling man's innate desire to be somewhere he is not. This uh, is a series of stories about this fictional uh, kind of a prospector character named Old Pard. I enjoy so much reading this stuff. It's so fun. I think, you know, it seems obvious now, looking back on it, that that Ward was writing this kind of a character to symbolize, in some sense, his own life. You know, he he felt that he was Old Pard. He was the uh, the old wizened prospector in the dusty environment of the southwest and (laughs) digging dig and delve right digging and delving for more then another humorous piece that he wrote a book called trivia from bolivia but this was penned under his real name uh c warden smith hand bound book that is falling apart given to me actually in 2001 this is maybe the last piece that he had given me this is a series of humorous stories all of it typed by hand on manual typewriters little portable typewriters and then finally was this other book it is a cardboard binding and he has this decorative paper just covering up the front of it but it's this is called Nostalgia Train in Memory Lane. It was given to me in 1989, and it's written on very now yellowing paper, and it's a series of poems that describe his life, uh, again, growing up on the mountain in Nova Scotia. It's just kind of the capstone of all of what he wrote. I just want to say that it's a real blessing to have this. I don't really know if too many people in his family who are left have any of these writings and to be honest with you I don't really know much of where his family is anymore but I would like to do something with these works I'm not sure what but at least get them into some library or something it would be nice but in in the meantime they're in my library and they do bless me I do refer to them read them and I my memories of Ward come back to me as I read these stories. So one of the last uh, pieces I have in my stack of memorabilia here is a letter that I received from Ward in 2004 when he was living in Yuma, Arizona. And I want to show you, first of all, the typeface on this. It's kind of a purplish colored uh, ink. Joe and Andrea, how are you? Winter is about busted, I guess. Haven't had any here couple short rainy spells and some cool nights. Typing on a new machine for me, an Adler. Had not heard of Adler. Beautiful piece of work. Years old, but state-of-the-art for manual. Must have been expensive. Got it for $40. Also got a two-year-old electric, never used, for $35. have not used them much. And there is his signature and smiley face. But I, I thought it was interesting in this letter that this is 2004, and he's living in Yuma, Arizona, and uh, he's a typewriter collector, even back then. Finding typewriters at the thrift stores, he discovered this Adler. had a really nice typeface, by the way. You know, it's really kind of sad that we kind of lost touch at the very end. Uh, he went back to Canada, and I hope you know a little bit more about him now than before. Just from this brief, brief glimpse of some of the things he wrote and trying to preserve his memories alive of his past. And he used the tool of the manual typewriter to do that. And he used it as a means of self-publishing. And I think that's real important today. I I think there's real value there in considering the manual typewriter as a, uh, as kind of a printing press. That's really what he was doing with all this stuff is it was his own little private printing press in his room on his table and he was hand publishing these memorabilia and i hope you guys would consider doing the same this story wouldn't be complete without you knowing that uh, ward was the principal reason why today i am a typewriter collector and user i don't think there's any other reason besides him I wasn't really aware of the utility of portable manual typewriters until I became friends with Ward and saw what he was doing with them. I saw that they weren't just 
mechanical devices to collect, but he was using them to write. He was a writer with them, and I saw how he integrated the portable manual typewriter into his life for creating uh, these pieces and uh, documenting his memories. And uh, just as he has been an inspiration to me, uh, I hope that we, as typewriter users and lovers, we can uh, spread the good news about how these tools are not only wonderful mechanical devices to own, but they are, more importantly, tools of creativity that we can use to uh, bless others with. Mm -hmm.